Dear passengers, is there a doctor, nurse or anyone with medical training on board? We have a person in need in carriage C. Is there a doctor on the train? Well, I've been qualified as a doctor for slightly less than a year. I'm about to go into my second year of practice. I was traveling to a conference and heard that, is there a doctor or a nurse on the train or someone with medical training? Could you please come to the front of the train? We've got someone in distress. Hello, my name is Ollie. I'm a junior doctor living and working in England. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today, I'm gonna to be telling you what happened during my first encounter with the is there a doctor on board situation, what happened, how I felt about it, and some things I can take away and use as learning points for the future. Now it should go without saying that I'm not going to be going into the medical details of what happened, some details will be changed to keep the story non-identifiable, and I obviously can't discuss exactly what happened, this is more about the situation as a whole, how I felt about it, and again, some useful learning points that we can all take forward together. Before we jump into the video, if you're not already subscribed, please do so. My rotor is making it increasingly difficult to bring content out on time, but liking and subscribing is one of the most reliable ways to help the channel grow and ensure that videos are still seen. Thank you very much. So anyway, back to the story, the call goes out. I put all my stuff down, I was doing some work on my laptop at the time, asked some of the passengers next to me to watch my stuff, didn't know how long I was going to be gone but got up and started going down the train to go and answer the call. And on the way up, because I had quite a ways to walk the length of the train, the major thing going through my mind was what are the most dangerous, life-threatening things that I need to be able to spot or identify as I'm going to answer this call. These could be things like major trauma, a stroke, anaphylaxis, a heart attack, things like that that are going to need very, very rapid medical attention and escalation to a hospital. The second thing that then crossed my mind was, well, if it is any of these really major things that I'm worried about, I'm actually very limited as to what I can do then and there, if someone is having a stroke or if someone's having a heart attack or someone's bleeding out, for example, short of trying to stem the bleeding, there's not a lot I can do. But then the other major theme of thoughts I was having is obviously I'm going up there as an FY1 doctor. Like I said, shortly to be an FY2 doctor or a senior house officer, as you'll sometimes hear, but I am very limited in what I can do in these situations by my own grade and relative inexperience. Because I'm an F1 doctor, it's relevant to this story to consider the fact that I can't practice any kind of medicine outside of the constraints of my own training program or certainly outside my own trust, my own hospitals. Because Foundation Year One doctors are only provisionally registered with the General Medical Council, we don't hold our full medical license that would allow us to practice medicine in any setting. What I instead have to do in this situation is use my professional judgment and kind of sense of what is reasonable to provide the help that I can. But certainly making active medical recommendations or recommendations for treatment is something obviously that I knew I had to potentially steer clear from. Now to interrupt the story here, lots of people that I speak to, especially medical students, are worried about what happens when you become involved in these kinds of situations, when you're away from hospital, you're in an under-resourced setting, what are the legal implications of what you're doing? Can you be sued, for example, if you make a mistake or are deemed to be negligent when you're helping in this kind of scenario? Isn't it better not to get involved and then you can't possibly make a mistake and suffer the consequences? Well, there are two real key things to know about that protect you here, if you like. The first is that you're acting as a good Samaritan. You are going out of your way to help someone who genuinely might be in danger. And so-called Good Samaritan Acts are generally protected in the Social Action, Responsibility and Heroism Act 2015 which generally protects people acting to help in an emergency. The second thing to say is that the General Medical Council, that is the professional regulator for doctors, takes the position that if you are able to help as a doctor in such a scenario, that you actually have an ethical and professional duty to provide help. And it actually goes slightly further than that to say that even if you don't hold a full medical license for whatever reason, some examples given include being a medical student 
obviously being a foundation year one doctor who doesn't yet have their full medical license or a retired doctor who has relinquished their license you should not stop this from providing help in an emergency so like i said before i think it again becomes a question of your best judgment not going beyond your scope of practice or knowledge so not acting unsafely but still doing what you can to help in the position that you occupy. So back to the story now, I'm still going up the train to go and find this person, this patient. I'm gonna use person and patient interchangeably in this story. Perhaps the paramedics out there will have to advise me when a person becomes a patient. But the next thing I was thinking about was how I was going to do my A to E uh, approach when I reached the patient. For those of you who don't know, A to E is one of the most common frameworks when you're dealing with acutely unwell or emergency scenario people. It stands for airway, breathing, circulation, disability, and exposure. These are kind of five domains in which if any of the parameters that you're thinking about are severely deranged, these can cause loss of life or permanent injury or disability quite easily if not treated. So airway is the first and most major concern. If there is any disruption to someone's airway, that can quite obviously be a significant danger to them, equally if there are problems with their breathing, with the way their heart is functioning, and so on. But a few of the things that you check during this A to E protocol require specific equipment. For example, I could take a pulse, I could feel for a heartbeat, I could check that someone's chest was expanding properly using just my hands and my clinical knowledge. What I can't do is take a blood pressure. For example, as you need specific equipment, a sphygma manometer to do that, I couldn't take a temperature, I couldn't listen to someone's chest or listen to their heart sounds because that would require a stethoscope. So I was just running through that A to E emergency scenario and what can I actually do without any of my extra equipment that I would normally have. And just as I was about to reach the person, a crew member um, sort of accosted me on the way there and was like, thank you for coming, um, clarified that I was a doctor. She said, is there anything you need? I asked for the onboard first aid kit. Obviously, I had no idea what I might need or what we might be about to deal with. But for some instances, obviously, if someone's having an allergic reaction and they're in anaphylaxis, you would need adrenaline in order to fix that in the form of an EpiPen. So finally, I reached the person in question and there's already a nurse there. Um, who has already arrived. There was a moment of hesitation, obviously, so we're both in plain clothes, not really knowing who the other person was or what our skill sets were, but uh, I introduced myself as, a, as an F1 doctor. She was a nurse, and she was already partway through taking a history by the time I got there. Now, it is a bit weird in these scenarios because in hospital, we're very used to a hierarchy developing very quickly, and I'll talk about that more in a moment usually the most senior, most qualified person takes over leading the situation in an unknown. She did offer for me to take charge. She said, I'm, I'm just taking a history. Do you want to take over? But given that she was already part way through and obviously she knew what she had already asked, um, I said, no, you carry on. You please finish your history. I'll listen, but I'll start doing a physical exam and A to E while you finish the history. And I'll listen along while you do that just to save time because obviously still don't know quite what we're dealing with. So she carried on doing the history. I did the A to E as best I could with my hands and with no extra equipment. And then once she'd finished the history, I asked a few more questions just based on my examination findings. But the long and short of it is that the person was, by my estimation, absolutely fine, didn't need any kind of urgent medical attention. But again, my relative inexperience and grade comes into this because one of the train crew came and asked me and said look we've got the paramedics en route we've called an ambulance they're coming at the next station to get the patient do you think that's the best thing to do and again i had to be very clear about my role and my grade and saying look hands up you know i am a doctor i am trained i don't think this person needs urgent medical attention however i am limited by my grade and my contract i'm not allowed to practice medicine outside of my hospital so the best thing to do the most appropriate medical legal thing to do is for the patient to go with the paramedics they can assess them do whatever they want and if they want to take them to a and e then that's their prerogative i can't i can't really say yes or no to that it's not appropriate so that's what we did and after that conversation had taken place a more senior doctor arrived at which point the nurse bowed out and said look there are two doctors here um, I'm not going to add anything at this point, so that was fine. There's then only two of us left with the patient. I did a quick S-bar handover of the history that had been taken and my examination findings, the sort of 
differential diagnoses we'd come up with. But there wasn't really anything left to do at that point. We sort of introduced ourselves, had a bit of a chat, and then went and sat down again. So just some reflections and kind of key learning points to, to close out this quick story. And this is, I think, really relevant for student healthcare professionals, particularly if you're a medical student, physician associate student, a paramedic student, student nurse, and so on. The first is to say it's, it's perfectly okay to fall back on your training. Um, you are trained to deal with emergency scenarios, even if it's a bit daunting and a bit unclear. If you are the most appropriate person to be leading that scenario, that is to say, if you've got more medical training, even as say a third year medical student, than most of the people around you, then you are the right person to be in charge. And don't be afraid to go and use your training for the benefit of someone else that may need it. The second thing to say, and I alluded to this before, is that normally in emergency scenarios, especially in hospital, there is a quite a clear chain of command. That is to say, the most senior clinician, whoever that person is, usually takes charge. Um, it would usually be the most senior doctor present, whether that is a registrar or a consultant. But basically, it should be the most relevantly qualified person present, and essentially someone who's going to make sure that things get done and that we don't fall victim to the bystander effect and everyone stands around watching and doing nothing. It was a bit weird in this scenario because I am a relatively inexperienced doctor, admittedly one who's recently done ALS, that's advanced life support, so for dealing with acutely unwell patients, but again, when I arrived, I don't know how experienced this nurse is, what specialty they do, they could have been a nurse for 15, 20 years. We obviously didn't know each other's skill sets at the beginning, and there's not a lot of time in an acute scenario to work that out, so I was actually really appreciative um, to the nurse who, who just sort of said, look, if you want to take charge, if you think it's appropriate, you can, and I'll back down and put the ball in my court, and we kind of reach the compromise, you're already into your history, you carry on, I'll start examining the patient because it's the most expedient thing to do. So that's where I'm going to leave it, guys. Thank you for watching. I'd really like to know, have you ever been in a situation like this before, either as a, a medical student or a student of another health discipline, or indeed as a newly qualified physician or a more senior physician? Did it take longer for this to happen on a train, a plane, a bus, out in public, in the middle of the road, on the pavement. How did it happen? Let me know what happened, how did you handle it, and any advice that we can all learn from each other and take forward. Thanks very much for watching, guys. Take care, and I'll see you next time.